All right, welcome. Uh, my name is Jen Reynolds. I'm an associate professor and associate dean at the University of Oregon School of Law. It's wonderful to have you here today. Uh, before we get started, let's go through a few technological points. Um, Please stay muted throughout this meeting. So if you don't know how to do that, if you look at your bottom left-hand corner, there's a mute button. If you could just mute yourself, that would be great. That keeps us from having a lot of extra feedback. Please keep your video off if possible. And this is because it can improve the broadband. So at the bottom also you see stop video. That's where you can turn it off. And you can turn it back on later if you feel like it. It's, uh, it's, it just helps with the, with the technology. Uh, note that you should be in speaker view, not in gallery view. So at the top, you'll see um, an option to go to either gallery view or speaker view in the upper right hand. Uh, speaker view is better because then you'll have a better view of the speaker. Uh, if you have a question for our speaker today, please write it in the chat. I'm going to moderate the event and I will keep track of questions. So if you write them in the chat, I, I'll have them. Uh, if you have any technical problems during this event, uh, you can private chat me. You'll notice in the chat it either goes to everyone or just to me. Um, you can private chat me and we'll try to figure it out. Um, if you get kicked out of Zoom, it definitely happens. Just rejoin or if that doesn't work, restart your computer and then rejoin. That's what I'm going to do if I get kicked out. That's what Howie will do if he gets kicked out. So uh, uh, hopefully that won't happen. But in any event, we're going to record this event and put it on the law school's website, so you'll have access to it after afterward. Uh, for those of you seeking CLE credit, um, I'm going to be submitting the list of attendees to the bar after this event, and you can go to the OSB website to ensure that your credit gets applied. Okay. Uh, with that, let's turn to our event. Today we are talking about the recent United States Supreme Court case, McGirt v. Oklahoma. What does it mean and what might happen next? We're joined by our own professor, Howie Arnett, who teaches a number of courses on Indian and tribal law at the law school. Professor Arnett has practiced law for 40 years in Arizona and Oregon, representing tribal governments, tribal members, and Native American associations. His law practice in Bend has included work for tribes on treaty rights, tribal sovereignty, tribal law development, government-to-government -government relations, water rights, and gaming. Professor Arnett has a bachelor's degree from Stanford, a master's degree from the London School of Economics, and a JD from the University of Oregon School of Law. We are so fortunate to have Professor Arnett in our community, and I cannot wait to hear him speak today. Welcome, Professor Arnett. Thank you. Thank you, Jen, and hello, everybody. I'm gonna to go to screen share. We've got PowerPoints, and we're gonna work our way through a bunch of PowerPoints uh, for this presentation and talk about McGirt. So I'm gonna start pulling up the PowerPoints, and this is the first one, if I can get my screen share to work. And it should be, here we go. Okay, um, McGirt. This is the case announced by the Supreme Court on the last day of their term, which usually ends in June, but due to pandemic and unusual circumstances, it went into July this year. And on the last day of the term, uh, on July 9th, uh, less than a month ago, Supreme Court announced its decision in McGirt versus Oklahoma, a much watched case by Indian law practitioners and tribes and tribal leaders and states around the country with large Indian populations. And the reaction has been, has been really kind of incredible. Uh, I've called it in my PowerPoint slide, the most headline generating Indian law case in modern history. And as Jen said, I've been, I've been doing this for quite a while and I can't remember anything quite like this case in terms of uh, the publicity and the national media and even international media attention is generated. So I pulled some, some uh, national media headlines out to sort of um, see what the, you know, what the headline writers thought was the, was the catchphrase, what's the hook for general news audiences. Washington Post and BBC World Service both said that the case, in effect, said that much of eastern Oklahoma remains Indian land. Uh, the Washington Post said the Supreme Court said that. They actually didn't say that. Uh, they said something less than that, but it may end up that what they did say leads to contribution of Oklahoma uh, remaining in the land. The BBC World Service said pretty much the same thing. The Supreme Court rules half of Oklahoma is Native American land. It's not exactly what the Supreme Court ruled. They ruled they're part of it, a former Creek territory, about the size of Delaware in eastern Oklahoma is Native American land. Uh, but that 
probably lead to um, the other four of the so-called five civilized tribes, the large territories in eastern Oklahoma, ending up in the state lines that we ended up with this decision. The Cursing Science Monitor I had the best headline because it, to me, captured uh, the ruling. Uh, and Justice Gorsuch uh, wrote the 5 4 majority opinion. And some of the slides are going to uh, quote it from the majority opinion, and also from Chief Justice Roberts' uh, long dissenting opinion. Those two, those two justices go at it uh, in, in this case. And it's, it's fascinating to watch how they do that. Christian Science Monitor said in the Oklahoma tribal decision, quote, the rule of the strong falls to the rule of law. And that's a paraphrase of, um, of Gorsuch's phrasing. The rule of the strong means the state, and essentially a state mistake for 113 years. Uh, that rule of the strong uh, falls to the rule of the law, which is the law of strict interpretation of applicable legal principles regarding congressional statutes that may or may not have disestablished an Indian reservation that was established in the 19th century. So. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to go to the next slide. Uh, wait, wait, we went too far. Uh, excuse me. Okay. This is the next slide. This is a quote from the opening sentence of the um, McGirt opinion, uh, Justice Gorsuch's opening line of the majority opinion. On the far side or the far end of the trail of tears was a promise. Um, that's, uh, that's poetic and uh, it's historic too. And um, Gorsuch knows full well this is a big case, big case, and particularly the uh, effect and impact of the decision uh, in Oklahoma and beyond Oklahoma is, is significant and exactly what all the implications may be going forward, it's not clear. But he started, he started beautifully uh, with the idea that there was a promise. Uh, the promise was made uh, in 1832 and 1833 with treaties between the Creeks and the United States government establishing a new permanent home in Oklahoma in exchange for their uh, really unwilling removal from their ancestral homelands in um, Georgia and Alabama. We'll talk about how that happened. But this was the promise that there's a new land for you in Oklahoma, Indian Territory at the time. Uh, and that's what we promise you. That's what the United States promised. And that became the Creek Reservation. Uh, and then he also said that uh, in presenting the issue and the decision, the issue in considering this promise is whether the lands these treaties promised in these early 1830s treaties remain an Indian reservation. Do those lands remain an Indian reservation today? And then he goes to the conclusion, which is that because Congress has not said otherwise, nothing Congress has done since it created the reservation had the effect of uncreating, disestablishing, or eliminating the reservation. So the outcome is the government has held to its word that it has created a reservation. <clears throat> the roadmap for today's discussion is as follows. We'll first of all talk a little bit about the unusual route that McGirt took getting to the Supreme Court. And it's unusual because it really was the second case before the court in the last few years presenting exactly the same issue. But the way it actually became the premier case to decide the issue, McGirt did, is led to Gorsuch playing a pivotal role and the deciding role uh, in the outcome. And then we'll look a little bit at um, Oklahoma and uh, Indian law in Oklahoma. And I know there are lots of Indian law practitioners uh, on this webinar. And I think everybody has always assumed and understood until now that Indian law was a lot different in Oklahoma. We'll talk about why that assumption was created and how going forward, it may not be so different. We'll look at the facts of McGirt as well. McGirt is a criminal case and a lot of these these what we call diminishment or disestablishment cases. That's the little subset of federal Indian law that applies to uh, the McGirt case and the legal questions in the McGirt case are criminal cases. And usually it's a criminal defendant who's convicted in state court for a crime that he says actually was committed on an Indian reservation and therefore there was no state court jurisdiction to charge him or prosecute him and the, um, the case must go away, the state court case, and it must be a federal case instead. 
McGirt's facts um, are uncomfortable. Um, McGirt uh, crimes were awful, horrendous, and uh, if you want to know what they were, you can read the Chief Justice's uh, dissent. Uh, he was sentenced to a thousand years plus life in uh, the uh, Oklahoma Correctional Facilities. Uh, <clears throat> then he challenged, uh, and we'll look at this in a minute, uh, he challenged this on the grounds that uh, other criminal defendants had in cases leading to Supreme Court decisions about whether a reservation was shrunken, diminished, or totally eliminated, disestablished. And that will be the, uh, uh, the issue before the court in the McGirt case. Because if um, McGirt's crimes, which occurred, everybody agrees, within the boundaries of the historic Creek Reservation, the question is, is the historic reservation still a reservation? If it's still a reservation, uh, it's subject to um, the Indian country definition of uh, the circumstances controlling application of federal criminal laws on Indian reservations. And the applicable federal criminal law is the Major Crimes Act, which applies to serious offenses committed by Indians within the boundaries of an Indian reservation. So those are the facts, and that's the issue before the court is, was the Creek, historic Creek Reservation uh, ended at some point in history? Uh, and so McGirt's crimes occurred within the jurisdiction of the state of Oklahoma, like anywhere else in the state, or was it uh, still around? Was the reservation still in existence? In which case, uh, the crime occurred in Indian country, in which case the Major Crimes Act would be the only basis for prosecuting McGirt. We'll also look at the historical backdrop of how the Creeks came from the Southeast to Oklahoma and how many, so many other tribes ended up in Oklahoma, which is another reason it's, it's unique and, and different. Uh, and then the development of uh, the Creek Nation uh, from their removal to Oklahoma through the end of the 19th century, what's called the allotment era, into the 20th century, early part, still the allotment era, and then into the modern era. And then we'll look at the uh, legal analysis, um, the applicable cases. The Supreme Court's actually been quite active in, over the years in this area, this diminishment, disestablishment, jurisprudence area. And we'll look at uh, the cases and what they say is the proper analysis. And actually, um, the majority and the dissent agree on what the relevant cases are, and they even agree on the analytical framework for applying the lessons of those cases, but they take a different tact, obviously, uh, you can tell from the cases and the outcome uh, in applying that analysis to reach the conclusion that in the majority's case, that the reservation still exists in the dissent's uh, view, it did not exist, it was disestablished. Uh, then we'll look at the role of Justice Gorsuch. He's become an outsized figure on the court in terms of Indian law and, and how that came to be, whether that was foreseen, when he was on the 10th Circuit and then um, uh, selected and nominated and confirmed. And then we'll also look at the impacts um, beyond the McGirt case and within, within uh, uh, Creek territory in terms of civil jurisdiction, uh, tribal jurisdiction, uh, beyond the, the realm of criminal laws, and uh, maybe other, other former historic reservations in, in, um, in Oklahoma. Uh, the civilized tribes and others and beyond that in, in Oklahoma and elsewhere in the country. I just saw uh, that a, um, a brief was filed yesterday in the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals in a case involving the Little Travers Band uh, Chippewa Indians in Michigan uh, and it's arguing uh, and actually the brief was filed by the attorney for the, for the uh, uh, Little Travers Band who happened to be the same attorney Riaz Kanji representing the Creek Nation in the Supreme Court. Uh, in the case and arguing that McGirt uh, controls the disposition of this uh, diminishment or disestablishment case in the Sixth Circuit. So lawyers are already making use of, um, of McGirt. So what about the unusual route of McGirt's Supreme Court? Go back two terms. Uh, October 2018, the SCOTUS term, a case called Sharp versus Murphy is before the Supreme Court. It's an identical issue. Murphy is a Creek tribal member. He murdered somebody. It's a capital case uh, within the boundaries of the historic um, Creek Reservation. And what's different about the Murphy case from the McGirt case is after Murphy was convicted, it's a capital case. He's on death row in Oklahoma. Um, he went to exhausted his state court post-conviction relief remedies. He went to federal court, filed a federal court habeas corpus petition, arguing that there was no jurisdiction to try and convict him in state court. 
Um, the district court in Oklahoma said he was wrong, that the reservation had been disestablished, there was state court jurisdiction, he's still on death row. He appeals to the Tenth Circuit. The Tenth Circuit has quite a go around with it, but ultimately concludes that the reservation was not disestablished. And so the ruling in the Tenth Circuit was Murphy's right, Creek Reservation still exists, Oklahoma has no jurisdiction to try him criminally, and uh, he should be off death row. He should be prosecuted under the Major Crimes Act in federal court. Uh, <clears throat> the Tenth Circuit was then, um, was not the last word, of course. Uh, Oklahoma went to the Supreme Court, filed a cert petition, cert was accepted. The court struggled with the Murphy case, and it struggled with it with just eight justices. Because Murphy came from the Tenth Circuit, and Justice Gorsuch had been on the Tenth Circuit, as Murphy was being considered by the Tenth Circuit, he participated in some way, shape, or form. So he had to recuse himself when the case got to Supreme Court, and he did that. So it's eight justices who were considering the Murphy case. Um, they had oral argument. It was lively. Uh, and they requested post-argument supplemental briefing on some unusual questions like, is it possible to have a reservation? Uh, but if there's a statute that says Oklahoma has criminal jurisdiction, is, is that possible? Uh, and things like that. Uh, and then everybody waited for the decision and the last day of the term in something the Supreme Court almost never does, uh, they announced that they were simply gonna set that case for re-argument in the following term, the October 2019 term. Uh, they don't tell you why they're doing that, but it seemed likely that there was a 4-4 tie on the court. And because there was a 4-4 tie, usually the effect of a 4-4 tie, if somebody's recused, is that the circuit court decision is the law, is affirmed. There's just nothing coming from the Supreme Court. So, but with the big issue in this case, whether, you know, Northeastern Oklahoma and the former Creek Historic Territory was a reservation or not, and the 10th Circuit's decision was that it was, that's just too big to just let it be decided by the 10th Circuit and then 4-4 tie in the Supreme Court. So the Supreme Court set it over for re-argument in, uh, in the next uh, term. And so, oops, this is what happened. Uh, the October 19th uh, term, the one that just ended, the court now accepted certiorari in the McGirt case, and it arrived from the, an appeal from the Oklahoma Court of Criminal Appeals, which is the highest state court, appellate court, concerning criminal matters in Oklahoma. Uh, Gorsuch doesn't have to recuse himself for this case, so he didn't. So now there are nine justices. They never scheduled the Murphy case for rehearing. They just heard the McGirt case. And then it was decided on the last day of the term. Justice Gorsuch uh, wrote the 5-4 majority opinion. And on the same day, uh, the Supreme Court issued a per curiam opinion in the Murphy case, affirming the Tenth Circuit. And it turns out there were also four cert petitions pending at the end of the last term and they were all from Oklahoma, and they were all raising the same questions, but they were with different historic reservations. Two, I think, were from uh, Choctaw, former Choctaw territory. One was from uh, a series of eight uh, reservations, small ones in northeastern Oklahoma, and it was based on a theory that the treaty with the eight tribes in northeastern Oklahoma uh, was, uh, they were still existed, those reservations were never gone. So those cert petitions were sent back to the Oklahoma Criminal Court of Appeals uh, and for reconsideration and remanded uh, in view of the Supreme Court's decision in, um, in uh, McGirt. So whether McGirt is going to spread beyond, uh, beyond uh, former Creek territory is going to be considered uh, by, this, by the Oklahoma uh, Court of Criminal Appeals. So um, the issue is now below. That's how McGirt got to Supreme Court. Let's see here. Uh, there we go. Okay. Uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit about about Oklahoma and about the history of the of the, the Creek tribe and the Creek Nation. Um, anybody who's been in, a, in one of my Indian law classes, the very first thing we do in the first day is kind of put up a map of Indian Country, the United States. Uh, talk about where reservations are, where the Indian people are in all 50 states, including Alaska and the natives in Hawaii. Uh, and this is the map we always use. And um, the green represents Indian reservations. 
they're mostly in the West and they're in the upper Midwest and Minnesota, Wisconsin, uh, Minnesota, and Michigan and so on. And then you look right in the middle and that's Oklahoma. And Oklahoma is blue. Well, what is blue? It's not green, so it's not a reservation. What is blue? If you go over and look at the legend on the map of Indian Country USA before McGirt, it says those are tribal statistical areas in Oklahoma. So these are basically the historic reservation areas in Oklahoma, but they're not considered reservations anymore. There's one little bit of a green area, which is Osage, and I think Osage may be considered a reservation, but by and large, all the other tribes in Oklahoma are considered not to have reservations. They have tribal statistical areas. Um, so that's the map of Indian country pre -Magurt. So Oklahoma has a lot of things that make it different uh, than the rest of Indian country. And we've always said Oklahoma is different. And I've said in classes, just look at the map. You can see it's blue. That's something different. And also the other two places in the country, just for your information, uh, are Alaska and Hawaii that are so different that a lot of the national basic principles of Indian law uh, don't apply or apply differently. So we're in Oklahoma. Oklahoma is a big Indian tribe, a big Indian uh, state. There are 39 tribes. That's a lot. Uh, it's not as much as some states. California's got 110, Alaska's got 243 or something. So 39 tribes in Oklahoma, but what's interesting is only five are actually indigenous to Oklahoma. The rest are not indigenous to Oklahoma, and we'll look at how they got to Oklahoma uh, through the history of the territorial era in, in the 19th century. And the other thing that, so we thought, was that there were no reservations in Oklahoma. So only five indigenous tribes to the state, the rest are, are foreigners to the state essentially, and there are no reservations, so that's different. Tribal citizens make up 10% of Oklahoma's 4 million populations. That's, that's large, that's a lot. Um, some of them are very prominent. The governor of the, st uh, the state, uh, Kevin Stitt, is a Cherokee uh, citizen, tribal member. Um, doesn't keep him from having a big fight with his tribe and other tribes over gaming um, uh, issues right now. Um, and there are also two members of the five member delegation to Congress are uh, tribal citizens. Tom Coles, a, a Chickasaw, Mark Wayne Mullins, a Cherokee. Um, all of them, including the governor, are Republican, of course. Oklahoma is, is a pretty red state. But it's, um, it's proud of its Native heritage. This used to be the license plate from Oklahoma. Uh, Native America. And it looks like it's a tribal war shield. So how did all these other tribes get to Oklahoma? By the way, this is the map. It didn't take long to redo the map. The same Indian country map uh, we put up before. Um, but there it is green. Uh, now, uh, all of eastern Oklahoma, not just um, Creek country, which is right there, but Chickasaw down here, Choctaw down here, Cherokee down here, and Seminole over here are all considered reservations by the, by the new map makers. So um, Oklahoma's not looking so different anymore than the rest of the country uh, in terms of Indian law. Uh, so how did all these tribes end up in Oklahoma, these 34 tribes that are not indigenous to Oklahoma. It is because of this. Um, early uh, to mid 19th century removal of tribes from the South and tribes from the Midwest to Indian territory. Um, and the removal was one of the government's very first um, purported solutions to what's always been called the Indian problem. Uh, and it was perceived that the solution to the Indian problem in the early 19th century and in the middle of the 19th century was to simply move the Indians, move them out of the south, move them out of the Midwest, and move them west of the Mississippi and move them to one area we call it Indian Territory. So these are all tribes in the south. You see, uh, you see the uh, uh, Seminoles, Cherokee, Creeks here. Chickasaw, Choctaw, these are the so-called five civilized tribes, and here are tribes from the upper Midwest, Kickapoos, Miami, Potawatomi, Sac and Fox, and so on, all moved to, to Oklahoma. Later, this map doesn't show up, but later in the 19th century, other tribes were moved to Oklahoma because they fought wars with the United States and lost the wars. Two of those tribes are from Oregon, uh, the Modoc tribe uh, from uh, Southern Klamath County in, in California, fought the Modoc War, lost the Modoc War, 
and in 1873, they were moved to Oklahoma. They're still a Modoc tribe in Oklahoma. And most of them are back and are members of the Klamath tribes in that army. The Joseph Band and Nez Perce fought the Nez Perce War with the Army in 1877, lost it, and ended up in Oklahoma. Um, but they were there for five years and found their way back to the Northwest. But not to Nez Perce country in Idaho or their beloved Willow Valley, which is where the Joseph Band is from in Oregon, northeastern Oregon. They ended up on the Colville Reservation in Washington. So, um, focused a little bit more on the on the uh, removal of the five civilized tribes. This all happened in the, um, in the 1830s. And back to all, tag the focus here a little bit. Um, uh, you can see that uh, the Cherokees were removed in 1835, the Creeks in 1832. You can see that uh, Cherokees are their ancestral territories in Georgia in the uh, Tennessee River Valley, north of Creekster in Alabama and Georgia, then the Chickasaws over in Tennessee and uh, Mississippi and the Choctaws in Mississippi and Seminoles from Florida. And this map traces their, their trail of tears. Each of the tribes, each of the nations had an individual removal march uh, enforced by the army uh, over a thousand miles in most cases from their historic lands to Oklahoma. Um, this was all pursuant to the policy announced by Congress uh, in 1830 with the Removal Act, declared a policy that the government should seek to remove the tribes from the Southeast uh, to Indian Territory in Oklahoma. And um, the Cherokees were among the last to be removed because they were actually litigating in the Supreme Court and they won. They especially won a case in uh, 1832 called Worcester versus Georgia, where the Supreme Court recognized um, their sovereignty and their treaty rights from 1785 uh, Hopewell Treaty, their right to be a separate and independent people. But nonetheless, Andrew Jackson was um, president of the United States, controlled the army, and Congress fully supported him, and removal happened through a series of treaties for each of these tribes. Treaties at a gunpoint for the most part. And for the Creeks, those were the um, 1832 and 33 treaties. And that's the treaty that Gorsuch first talked about that set up this reservation for the Creek and the Seminoles in Oklahoma. And it's actually quite a bit larger than the one that's at issue in the McGirt case. Um, it stretches all the way across to, um, to the Texas Panhandle, uh, but it was later, later truncated. And, uh, and in the final Creek Treaty is in 1866. And the 1866 Creek Treaty uh, was post-Civil War and the Creeks were uh, more or less supported by the Confederacy in the Civil War, and so is kind of punishment. Uh, the subsequent 1866 treaty reduced the size of their 1832 and 1833 reservation to the one on this map, which is the one that's at issue in the McGirt case. And something similar happened with the Cherokees, the Choctaws, the Chickasaws, and the Seminoles, the other four uh, so-called civilized tribes from the, from the Southeast. But this treaty is still firm that this reservation, this 1866 reservation, was forever set apart as a home for the Creek Nation. So it was, it was clear that this is, this is a reservation, uh, without any doubt. Uh, the treaty didn't use the word reservation, didn't need to, and Gorsuch established that in his majority opinion that no one questions that this is a reservation, or was, in 1866. And uh, the dissent doesn't doesn't disagree. Oklahoma tried to, a new theory in the Supreme Court that it might not be a reservation. It, it didn't apply at all. Even uh, Roberts wouldn't go for it. So what happened after the Creek Reservation was established? Well, Congress came up with a new solution to what they call the Indian problem, uh, forced assimilation through the allotment policy, the 1887 General Allotment Act, the Dawes Act. And the way it worked, and this is a general statement of, of policy, which was implemented through a series of allotment uh, statutes specific to different reservations around the country. The idea was that Indian people should be turned into farmers, uh, have a piece of land, and they'll uh, eventually develop into industrious farmers just like the white settlers around them. And so reservations were broken into 160 acre parcels, Indian head of households on those reservations were provided a trustee to that 
allotment, 160 acres, and then if the, the land that was left over was opened up and called surplus land in most cases, and opened up to, to white settlement. That's the allotment policy in the Allotment Act. It was disastrous. It led to the loss of two thirds of all Indian land in the United States between 1887 and 1934 when it was stopped. Um, and uh, the Creek Reservation was no exception. There was an allotment statute for the Creek Reservation. So these are the statutes in part, that primarily that are looked at by the Supreme Court in the McGirt case to see whether these statutes had the effect of disestablishing, eliminating the 1866 Treaty Reservation. The 1901 Creek Allotment Agreement that authorized allotments on the Creek Reservation, it did not declare anything as surplus land sale. So there was a Five Civilized Tribes Act in 1906 uh, in 19, that uh, limited uh, the authority of the five tribal governments. Uh, in 1906, 1907, uh, Oklahoma's Enabling Act and Statehood Act. Um, and there was a theory, and it was uh, described by Justice, Chief Justice Marshall, or excuse me, um, Roberts in his dissent, everybody thought that the reservations were going to go away when Oklahoma became a state. That was kind of the understanding. The understanding wasn't exactly embedded in, in the statutes, but that may have been what people thought would happen. Oklahoma certainly thought so from the get-go. As soon as it became a state, it immediately began asserting global jurisdiction over the form of what it said were the former historic reservations of the five civilized tribes. So from that moment on, particularly in Creek territory, as well as the other Eastern Oklahoma historic lands, lands the state in exercising criminal jurisdiction and continued to do so until a month ago uh, when the McGirt decision came down. Uh, and there were even subsequent statutes uh, like the 1908 Amendment to the Five Tribes Act. Gorsuch and Roberts both tick through these statutes. Gorsuch ticks through the statutes to look for some evidence that Congress wanted to eliminate the reservation. Uh, Roberts ticks through these statutes to say, collectively, uh, read all together, uh, the evidence a, an intent to eliminate the reservation. There are some jurisdictional statutes that are central to the McGirt decision we need to talk about. The first is the Major Crimes Act. 1885, Congress passed a statute that declares that certain criminal acts, certain major crimes committed by Indians in Indian country are federal jurisdiction. And this is a response to a, a Supreme Court decision two years earlier involving a homicide on a reservation in Lakota country in South Dakota. One tribal member killed another tribal member. The tribe resolved it uh, through traditional dispute resolution and justice systems, which involved retri uh, uh, retribution, excuse me, um, uh, restitution uh, and so on. And the government said, that can't be, that's a capital crime. There has to be federal jurisdiction. So they charged the uh, Indian perpetrator in federal court with uh, the crime of murder. And the Supreme Court said, there is no such crime on an Indian reservation. Congress responded by passing the Major Crimes Act and it's still on the books today. That's the statute that McGirt will be prosecuted under going forward, the Major Crimes Act. It applies in Indian country. So what is Indian country? 1948 statute defines Indian country broadly very, very broadly. Uh, the subsection A of 1151, Title 18, the U.S. Code, says an Indian reservation, that's the Indian country statute, means all lands within the bounds of any Indian reservation. There's all kinds of lands on most Indian reservations. There's tribal trust land, there's individual trust allotments, there's tribal member-owned fee land, there's non-Indian owned fee land. Most reservations, or a lot of them, look like a checkerboard when you uh, view a map of the ownership of parcels on the reservation. For purposes of the Indian country statute and application of federal criminal law through the Major Crimes Act, it doesn't matter who owns the land. It doesn't matter what the ownership status is of any of the land within the boundaries of a reservation. It's all Indian country, all of it. Even if 95% of it is owned by non-Indians and they are the majority of the people on the reservation, it doesn't matter. It's still Indian country. So the question is, is the 1866 Creek Reservation still a reservation? That's the, that's the analysis. Or that's the question before the, before the Supreme Court. This is the applicable law, the rule of law that applies. It's from, uh, actually it started earlier, but the case most of the court looks at is Solemn versus Bartlett and his progeny. This is the analysis applied to a diminishment or shrinkage, reservation shrinkage question or a 
disestablishment reservation elimination question, which is the McGirt question. The starting point is only Congress can diminish or disestablish an Indian reservation. That's a bedrock principle because Congress has a power from the Commerce Clause, uh, which empowers it to essentially exercise plenary, almost unlimited power in the field of Indian affairs, but only Congress has that authority. So Congress only has that authority. Can Congress um, work uh, statutes to the disadvantage of tribes? Yes, it can. It can actually abrogate an Indian treaty. That's part of its plenary power. But that's a, that's a power to abrogate a treaty, to eliminate a reservation, or to shrink a reservation that's tempered by the trust responsibility uh, that's been held since 1831 and by Justice Marshall, Chief Justice Marshall, to be an obligation the government owes to tribes. It's assumed that the government acts with the tribe's best interests. So the canons of construction have been developed to say that there's a statute that purports to uh, eliminate a reservation or curtail tribal rights in some fashion. Congress has to be really, really clear, crystal clear that that's what it intends to do because it's kind of contrary to their trust responsibility. So the second principle of the modifying the bedrock principle is Congress's intent to diminish or to establish must be clear and unambiguous. And in this body of case law, the courts look to some clear language in the statute of cession or conveyance or relinquishment plus unconditional compensation. The court says there are no magic words, but there kind of are magic words, and those are some of them. Uh, and those are, the, those are the words that Gorsuch looked for in these statutes and could not find anything that evidenced that clear intent to disestablish the Creek Reservation. And so that's step one in the analysis, is look at the statute, examine the statute, and for Gorsuch, that's it. I mean, that's it. He's a textualist, and, and he said, once I look at the statute, I'm looking for these words, I don't see them. I look at all these statutes that apply to uh, during the allotment era to the Creek uh, Nation, and I just don't see it. It just, I look at each one of them individually. He parses through them in the, in the opinion. And so he said, that's it. Uh, we don't do anything more. That, that ends the inquiry. Um, Marshall, excuse me, Roberts, the Chief Justice says, no, that's not what those cases say. It says, we look at the statutes, but we should also look at the legislative history and the surrounding circumstances when the statute was passed. They might shed some light on what Congress really intended. We might even go further. We look at, since the statute was passed, who's really been exercising public safety, law enforcement responsibility on the reservation? Actually, who lives there today? What are the demographics? Those are steps two and steps three. Gorsuch says we never get to those steps unless there's some uncertainty, some ambiguity at step one, and we don't see any ambiguity. I don't, and the other four justices on my side don't, so that ends the inquiry right there. So, uh, excuse me. So this is just a, a sort of reiteration of how these statutes, they're, they're almost all in the context of allotment statutes. That's where these disestablishment cases usually and, and diminishment cases usually arise. This is an example of a, of a bill advertising surplus lands for sale in the early 20th century on, on Indian lands. And this is the diminishment disestablishment inquiry, as I just mentioned. You look for the statute uh, or statutes to see if there's any clear expression of congressional intent that suggests they understood they were disestablishing or eliminating or diminishing a reservation. And if uh, those words are there, uh, it's been diminished or disestablished. If the words are not there, the reservation still exists. And of course, it says, we stop. We stop the analysis right there. Robert says, no, 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 we go to more and look at, look at uh, other things like legislative history and so on. So, um, but he only had three other justices on his side. The competing arguments, essentially is McGirt, the tribe, Gorsuch, the rule of law. No clear congressional intent is just establish the Creek Reservation, so it still exists. That's, that's his interpretation, and it's now the prevailing interpretation under the disestablishment and diminishment analysis, the Solomon versus Bartlett and his progeny. If you can't find it in the statute, you stop looking. Oklahoma, the United States, and Roberts say, well, first of all, you gotta consider settled expectations. Uh, state has exercised criminal jurisdiction over Indians in Creek Territory since statehood in 1907. It would be hugely disruptive to change now. Then he also says you can't look at these statutes individually, each one of them, one by one in isolation, which is what Gorsuch did and said you do under Solomon. 
Instead, he says, we look at the cumulative effect of the multiple federal statutes between 1890 and 1907, and altogether, cumulatively, they events a you know, congressional intent to disestablish. So the outcome, though, is the five votes on Gorsuch's side said Oklahoma asked us to defer to its usual practice, meaning exercising criminal jurisdiction since statehood on Indian lands, and uh, instead of federal law, which he said uh, is clearly determinative because it's just not there. We've looked in the statutes, there is nothing there that would satisfy the rule of law requiring us to see some clear intent by Congress to disestablish or diminish the reservation. And Oklahoma's usual practices uh, cannot overcome federal law. It says it's something we will not and may never do. So um, it's nice or interesting, I thought anyway, to compare the sparring between the justice and the chief justice. Justice Gorsuch, unlawful acts performed long enough and with sufficient vigor are never enough to amend the law. To hold otherwise would be to elevate the most brazen and longstanding injustices over the law, both rewarding wrong and filling those in the right. That's the last sentence. First sentence was a great one. The last sentence is almost as good in the majority opinion. Uh, Chief Justice Roberts says, Congress has disestablished the reservation possessed by the Creek Nation through a relentless series of statutes leading up to Oklahoma statehood. Relentless series of statutes. One, two, three, four, five. Looks at all of them, read them collectively. It all adds up to disestablishment. And then he goes on to say, beyond criminal law, uh, that we would be destabilizing uh, governance in vast stretches of Oklahoma. Um, so, well, there's some Muskogee Creek leaders at uh, the Supreme Court which is uh, interesting because oral argument, it's a photo op because oral argument was on May 11th and the court is shut uh, on May 11th. It was done telephonically. So I think they were in probably their lawyer's office in Washington, but, but it's a good picture and it's in, from the tribal newspaper. So impact of uh, the McGirt decision. Uh, what about the other four civilized tribes? Everyone seems to assume the headline writers for BBC World Service and the Washington Post assume this decision applies to them too. And it probably will. Um, but you have to look at the individual statutes. Many of the statutes we looked at are actually five tribe statutes. Some of them are uh, assumed that the uh, allotment statutes for the other four tribes are very similar. So I think it's highly probable, highly probable that, uh, that uh, McGirt will be extended to the other four tribes in eastern Oklahoma. And then you will be looking at 93 or 43% of Oklahoma's land base being subject to McGirt. What about other Oklahoma tribes, Western and Northeastern tribes? Um, there's one of the cert petitions is for a group of those tribes in Northeastern Oklahoma that's been sent back to the Oklahoma Court of Criminal Appeals. Uh, everybody who's from those tribes is now looking at the Gorsuch analysis of the Solomon framework to see if, uh, if they can make a case that they have not been disestablished. Um, what about uh, uh, jurisdiction, jurisdiction, civil jurisdiction uh, on Indian lands in the New Creek Reservation? That's a different question. And it's still uh, encompassed within the boundaries of Indian country, but it depends on uh, whether it's fee land, whether it's non-Indian owned land, uh, who's being taxed, or maybe some issues of whether Oklahoma can still tax the income of tribal members. Uh, and I think there is an income tax in Oklahoma. And uh, there'll be some consequences, some, some real issues out there regarding civil jurisdiction. Um, what about tribes outside of Oklahoma? That's clearly something that, um, um, as I said, there's already a brief filed yesterday in the uh, Little Traverse Band case in the Sixth Circuit saying McGirt uh, dictates a different outcome here. And what about the impact on future case law, Indian law cases, the five justice majority? Um, I think there's, uh, there is clearly, clearly an indication, I'm gonna skip right now to Justice Gorsuch. Oh, just quickly, I wanted to look at a couple other slides about what is Tulsa, Oklahoma, now that it's a reservation town. It's not the first, this is the Agua Caliente Reservation in Palm Springs, California. You can't step off a street corner in downtown Palm Springs and not walk on to the Agua Caliente Reservation. It's every other section in Palm Springs. Closer to home is the Puyallup Reservation. It's most of the Port of Tacoma and a big hunk of downtown Tacoma uh, that is part of the Puyallup Reservation. So it's not completely unheard of for a major metropolitan area to be part of an Indian reservation. Um, so Justice Gorsuch, he was identified when his name was first floated for a Supreme Court uh, position. This is the Scalia post. And the tribes researched him and they said, he's our guy. We want him on the court. He had an excellent record on the 10th circuit, been on for 11 years. They tribes lobbied for him. The Native American Rights Fund and uh, National Congress of American Indians, the Supreme Court project, 
lobbied for his nomination and supported his confirmation. McGirt clearly shows that he will not be swayed by the settled expectations argument that's really frequently used against tribes in Indian law cases. He just does not care about that. He cares about the law. And he's voted in favor of tribal interests four out of the five cases since he's been on the court. And he ties Sotomayor and Kagan as the most pro-tribal justice. Uh, two years ago, he, he was the swing vote uh, in a case upholding Crow tribe treaty hunting rights in Wyoming, uh, and also a case from Washington involving the Yakima tribe's treaty right to travel. And he wrote the opinion in the Cougar Den case involving the Yakima treaty right to travel. He was also um, clearly on the tribe side in the Colbert's case. I was at that oral argument. It ended in a 4-4 tie, so it went back and became the Ninth Circuit judgment. But he, he came out firing to the Washington uh, Attorney General who was arguing the case on behalf of the tribe. He was clearly uh, supporting, supporting the tribe. So um, that's about all I have for now. And I think uh, we may talk about some other stuff a little bit in terms of the questions and answers. But that's... Uh, that's about the summary of McGirt and Gorsuch and impacts going forward. And Jen, I'll turn it back to you. Okay, great. Um, shall I put this, shall I stop the share? Yeah, sure, sure. Okay. All right, well, we have a little time for some questions. If you have any questions, you can either uh, raise your hand or you can type them in the chat. I actually did see a question that I can while people are thinking of their questions that I can share, which is um, what, what do you think the impact of the decision will be uh, on in other states? The questioner specifically mentioned Hawaii and another com uh, commentator mentioned that um, this case has already been used in the Seventh Circuit, but what, what, do, you, what do you see as impacts elsewhere? Well, um, as I mentioned, if it's, if, if, if it's a case involving the disestablishment or diminishment inquiry, and there are a lot out there, uh, any reservation that's, uh, you know, was heavily affected by the allotment era and particularly a surplus lands act as part of the allotment era. Um, and they, there's some uncertainty about uh, the current reservation boundaries or whether the reservation exists at all. This is huge. I mean, this, this will affect those tribes and apparently every other tribe in Oklahoma is going to make use of it, not just the other four uh, civilized tribes, but those those establishment, uh, disestablishment, uh, diminishment uh, cases are, are really all over the country. They're in Utah, they've been in South Dakota, they've been in North Dakota, uh, they're in the upper Midwest, um, any, of those, any of those places where the diminishment or disestablishment issue exists, they're gonna be helpful. I mean, basically Gorsuch has said, you just look at the statute, just look at the statute that, that somebody purports affects a diminishment or a disestablishment. And if the magic words, he would call them magic words, but if the attempt to disestablish or diminish is not clear, really crystal clear, then it didn't happen. It didn't happen. And you don't need to do anything more. Don't look at current demographics. There was some thought that, that at one point that the court might consider current demographics. Those always work against the tribe. Most of these areas have been settled by non-Indians, and, and that also feeds into the settled expectations argument, too, which of course it just disposed of, essentially, in this area of law. Okay, great. Um, Burke Hendricks asks, the state and the tribe seem to have pre-negotiated some text on how to move forward. Do you have a sense of how finely tuned that text is and how deep the agreement might run? Uh, I saw a little bit. I, you know, there, there's some references to it in the post- um, McGirt commentary talked about how the, the, the five tribes have been working on an agreement with the state and also including the United States and it may be something that was ready to present to Congress. Then I saw about a week ago that the uh, Creek leadership said we're not part of that and uh, we're, we're, we've been involved but we haven't signed off on this. So I don't know that the agreement is an agreement yet and uh, to the extent that it represents um, congressional legislation um, that's always tough, and there would have to be unanimity among all the parties. Certainly, all five tribes would have to be totally on board with this to have it a chance legislatively, I would think, anyway. There are four uh, tribal members of the House, two are Democrats, two are Republicans from Oklahoma, and, um, and uh, the two Democrats are women from Kansas and New Mexico. I would imagine they could persuade the Speaker not to bring it to the floor if, if they supported the dissenting tribe. Um, but it should be pointed out that Oklahoma and the tribes have worked out agreements in the past. For a long time, um, since statehood, 
Oklahoma had been exercising criminal jurisdiction everywhere in former uh, tribal lands. But even though they always said there was no reservations, they finally agreed about 30 years ago that individual trust allotments, parcels of trust land, which are also considered Indian country, they're small little islands of trust land out there. Oklahoma finally agreed, their state court said, we don't have jurisdiction because that is Indian country. It's not a reservation, it's individual parcels of trust land and we don't have jurisdiction. So suddenly Oklahoma lost criminal jurisdiction over these little parcels all over the state but the tribes and the state worked out agreements, cooperative agreements, cross deputization and so on, on how to handle jurisdictional questions, particularly criminal law questions from those allotments. And that's been in place for 30 years. They can just expand it to, you know, the former historic reservations in, in Eastern Oklahoma. Okay, great. Um, we have a number of questions around what the impact of the McGirt decision will be on non-tribal people who live in these areas. Well, first of all, um, criminal jurisdiction, uh, not much. Uh, in fact, none. If the case law in the complicated area of criminal jurisdiction in Indian country is that non-Indian on non-Indian crime always goes to state court. That's called the McRatney Draper rule. And so if you're a victim of a, a non-Indian and, and now within the boundaries of the New Creek Reservation, Restored Creek Reservation, and you're a victim of a crime, committed by uh, another non-Indian, you go to state court. Uh, state court prosecutes the non-Indian. If um, you are a uh, non-Indian who's the victim of a crime committed by a tribal member, that will go to federal court under the Major Crimes Act. If you are a non-Indian who commits a crime against a tribal member, that will also go to federal court under the Indian Country Crimes Act or the Assimilative Crimes Act. So if an Indian is either the perpetrator or a victim of a crime, it goes to federal court. If they're just not Indians involved, it's state court. Uh, in the civil law area, there could be some effects um, and uh, the tribe may attempt to assert regulatory authority. I know the oil companies are worried uh, going forward where the tribes are gonna assert uh, jurisdiction, taxing jurisdiction perhaps. That's complicated, depends on the status of the land and the entities being taxed by the tribe. Uh, the um, Montana case involving uh, tribal jurisdiction to regulate uh, non-Indians on non-Indian on fee land has two small exceptions, general rules they can't. So it, that'll just have to be developed. It wouldn't be dramatic, I would think, and it would be a case-by-case -case, uh, determination of the, the civil impacts in the civil arena. Okay, great. Um, sorry, I'm trying to I'm trying to look, I was listening and then I was trying to look at all these chats. Uh, so uh, here's one. I, it's, Sarah writes, how does this apply, this decision apply to Alaska Native corporations as compared to lower 48 tribes with identified reservation lands, if at all? Well, like I said, Alaska is different. And how it's different, especially after uh, the, the uh, Village of Inutai case in the Supreme Court, is there's only one reservation in Alaska. Uh, that's the Metlakatla Reservation in Southeast Alaska. The village corporation lands that are now in some cases owned by the, the villages, uh, those are not Indian country. That's what the Supreme Court said in uh, 1998, the village of Indian time. So they're not Indian country. Uh, so it has limited application. Uh, if, if, if the tribes in Alaska are able to convert their fee land, uh, village corporation land into trust land, which there's a process now to do that, um, if they can convert it into trust land, that becomes Indian country and they can rebuild Indian country parcel by parcel, in which case um, they, um, McGirt would, it's really not a statutory issue. That's a process to recreate a reservation. Uh, but the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act essentially ended all but the Metlakatla Reservation in Alaska in uh, the early 70s. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, uh, please comment upon the impact on state and local tax laws upon members, the impact of state and local tax laws upon members residing on tribal reservations? Well, um, one impact is that uh, there's a general principle that uh, uh, tribal members who live and work on Indian reservations uh, and they're in a state that has an income tax, they're not subject to the state income tax. And I think Oklahoma has an income tax, I'm not sure. If it does, um, the Creek tribal members and other tribal members from other tribes who live within the boundaries of the new 
newly restored creek reservation and earn their income on the creek reservation and not gonna be subject to Oklahoma income tax any longer. That's gonna be an impact on the state of Oklahoma. Could be significant. I skipped one slide. These tribes are big um, in terms of enrollment. I think Creek is 18,000 members. Uh, Cherokee is 300,000 members. And um, so the, from a population standpoint, there could be a you know, significant impact in terms of income tax uh, revenue impact the state of Oklahoma. Okay, great. And so um, we just have a couple more minutes left and I wanted to be sure to ask what cases you're watching. Okay. Could you pull up my screen share real quick, Jan? I don't know if I can. Oh, okay. Hang I can on. stop it, but I don't know if I can start it. Uh, let's see here. Uh, hang on. I've got a slide on this. <laughs> I can pull it up. Uh, okay. Okay. Cases to watch are three big ones. They're hugely consequential to tribes, particularly if they lose. The first is Brackeen versus Bernhardt. It involves the constitutionality of the Indian Child Welfare Act of 1968. There's an equal protection issue bedded in there. Uh, the theory is, is that uh, it's race-based legislation subject to strict scrutiny under the, uh, under the Constitution um, because uh, that's the classification of an Indian child. That's been rejected by the court before, but it's, um, getting some play in the Fifth Circuit in the lower court. Uh, it was just argued to an en banc panel of the Fifth Circuit in January and decision is pending. Whoever loses that is gonna seek cert, no doubt. Second case, FMC Corporation versus Shoshone-Bannock tribes. Ninth Circuit upheld tribal court civil jurisdiction over non-Indian business on non-Indian fee land. This, this touches on the Montana case and the, the limits or, or exceptions to uh, tribal jurisdiction in a civil context over non-Indians on non-Indian fee land. FMC is petitioning uh, for cert. The Ninth Circuit upheld tribal jurisdiction, which is great, and I think tribes would just like to see it stop there. Uh, cert petition is pending, and the Supreme Court said they want to hear the views of the Solicitor General, which always means they're interested. Um, if cert is accepted, this will be big. Gorsuch has been totally pro-tribal, but almost all the cases have been trust, or excuse me, have been treaty and statute cases. That's his, that's his wheelhouse. He's you know, parsing the language of treaties and statutes. In this area, civil jurisdiction, it's common law and it's Supreme Court common law. And I just don't know uh, Gorsuch's views on that. And I asked somebody who looked at his 10th Circuit uh, uh, record and there just wasn't much on this. So he will be key if this uh, case ends up in the Supreme Court. The last one is the Obamacare. Uh, constitutional challenge before the Supreme Court. Uh, you say, what's that got to do with tribes? What's it got to do with Indian law? The thing about it is that uh, when the Affordable Care Act passed Congress, they took the opportunity to embed the Indian Health Care Improvement Act, which essentially authorizes all tribal health care programs around the country, in Alaska, everywhere, uh, in the Affordable Care Act. If the Affordable Care Act is ruled as unconstitutional because of the um, individual mandate, uh, then, and the, the Indian Health Care Improvement Act isn't severed somehow from the Affordable Care Act, then it goes down as well. And the status of 400 or 500 Indian health care programs around the country is, uh, seriously, is seriously in question. So big cases, big consequences, um, cases to watch. Okay, well, thank you so much. And on behalf of the law school, thank you, Howie, for your time and expertise today. Um, it's been great to have all of you with us. Uh, we'll be posting this video soon and we'll send you an email when we do. Thanks and I hope you have a great rest of your week. Thanks everybody. Howie, thank you. I'm going to end the meeting. Okay, sounds good. Thanks, Jen. Talk you to you have later. a great rest of your week. Thanks again. You too. You're happy to.